Birthright by Hilda Hughes Martin Drake was considered to be clairvoyant from a little child. At the age of ten, he had dreamed of a drowning fatality in the brook on his uncle's farm. The very next morning they had found his grandfather lying face downwards in the ditch. His clothes were sodden with water, and he was dead, as Martin had seen him in his dream. Two years later, Martin, in the cold grey dawn in his waking hours, had seen, as clearly as if it had happened before him, the horse on which Lord Carney was riding stumble and fall, with its rider thrown under it. And when they picked him up, Lord Carney's neck was found to be broken. Martin's mother, susceptible to her boy's gifts, which were looked upon with disfavour by his father, who gave all his affection to his firstborn, Michael, took the vision as an evil omen. She had not been through the tragedy of her father's suicide for nothing. She rushed down to the manor, asked to see Lord Carney himself, and begged him not to ride to hounds that morning. He scoffed at the superstition of his steward's wife, who listened to the precocious prattling of her younger boy, and rode to the meet in the marketplace. Three hours later, his horse fell clumsily and rolled over upon its master. They carried Lord Carney home upon a hurdle, Carney with his broken neck and his mouth gaping. And Martin had felt a strange thrill of pleasure when he had been told. It was as he had predicted. He became a person of some importance in the village after that. The schoolmaster, who dabbled in spiritualism, suggested that Martin was mediumistic. The vision was, in his opinion, not due to the boy's clairvoyance, but to some spirit control. The child should be watched. Eminent research students, who were investigating psychic phenomena, should have an opportunity of talking with him. Mr. Drake, however, was indignant, and refused to consider such an infamous piece of humbug. His wife's pleading left him adamant. The boy was a prig, and should be thrashed until he dropped his posing. And when old women from the village tried to encourage Martin to have premonitions about themselves and their own concerns, Mr. Drake let it be understood that there was to be no more nonsensical talk of the kind. Perhaps his anger merely veiled his fear. Nothing Martin ever did could please his father. But any suggestion of the boy's supernatural powers merely infuriated him. And so, during the next few years, Martin's clairvoyance, call it what you will, was discouraged. Although his mother, convinced of her boy's uncanny powers, secretly regaled the ladies' sewing meeting with talk that brought a gleam to the eyes of the least susceptible, and made the superstitious experience a curdling of the blood. When he was twenty-four, Martin's father died. Mrs. Drake, a sensitive woman who had experienced a good deal of sorrow, lived on in the old house. Because Michael had followed in his father's footsteps and been made steward of the present Lord Carney's estate, a will, made several years before his death, left the entire estate to the elder son, since the widow had money of her own. In due course the will was proved, and Mrs. Drake grieved secretly because the bitterness of her husband for her younger son had lived on in his heart throughout his life, had outlived his body. It was as if the father's evil, bitter spirit towards her boy, their boy, brooded about the house even stronger in death than it had been in life. Once she spoke to Martin about it. I couldn't understand your father as he got older, she said. When I married him, I saw only the gentle side of his nature. He was loving and kind, but he faced all kinds of trouble, and he couldn't weather the storms. He was a bitter man, a cruel man. He did you a grievous wrong, my boy. He hated you in his lifetime, and his hate lives on. If he has any consciousness in that place where the dead go, he may come to be sorry. 
Perhaps it will trouble him. I can't rest at night in the room where we used to sleep. Perhaps you wouldn't mind changing bedrooms with me, my boy. It's silly, I know. Your nerves are going to pieces, mother, he said. I'll change rooms with you. He did as she bade him, and he too had many sleepless nights. He gave them the shock of their lives at breakfast time on the anniversary of his father's death. I couldn't sleep last night, he told them. I knew there was something strange about the place. I knew too what I should see. Oh, it was that old power working in me. I dreaded to see my father. His mother shuddered, her lips trembling, a strange sound whistling through her teeth. It was what she too had feared, but she dreaded still more that anyone should ever learn her secret, should know that her love for her man had slowly turned to hate and dread. Oh, she had trembled before him in his lifetime. She feared him still in death. It was terrible that having hated him so much, she had been forced to give him her body. The horror of it had seared her mind. But what was her boy saying now? She looked at him, drawing his hand through his long, straight brown hair. His eyes looked distorted as she watched him through, narrowing eyes. I dreaded seeing him, Martin said, in strange, thick tones. He hated me so. I could feel his hate wrapping round me. The air seemed to be full of it. I couldn't breathe. I thought I should choke where I lay. You must have had a nightmare, his brother interjected. But his mother hung upon every word. And then she turned her face aside and put her hand over her eyes, so that they should not look into her soul. It was awful, he went on. It was like a poisoned gas in the air, physical as well as spiritual, if you see what I mean. I tried to sit up and then fell back, exhausted. I was sick to the heart and horribly afraid. And I can remember those trivial things which do stand out on days like this. I heard the cuckoo clock in the hall. Just as I heard it a few minutes before he died, I can remember noticing the awful ticking of my own watch, which lay on the dressing table beside me, and ticked with a terrifying insistence, seeming to get louder and louder. I could hear the leaves tapping on the window, and the head of Abraham Lincoln on the table looked strange in the moonlight. Even the knobs on the bedstead with my dressing gown thrown over the rail were unnerving. I shall never forget it, the insistence upon my consciousness of all these things. And yet I knew that something terrifying was going to happen, that I was a prisoner, numb with gold yet suffocating slowly. Go on, his mother screamed, and they were both shocked by her voice, hollow and toneless. But Martin's voice was deep, and what he said seemed inevitable. People might cry, batter themselves against fate. These things were true, unalterable. I noticed the thing, near the window at first. Then it moved, sickeningly, towards the cupboard, as though it could not see, but must feel its way. And then it swung round and faced me, and I saw my father's face, with hollows where the eyes used to be, like a skull. A skull? Oh my God! Oh, the face was white, as he never was, even in death. I can't remember what clothes he had, or if he had any, but he wrung his hands, and 
A terrible dry sobbing came from his lips. I tried to scream out, but I couldn't make a sound. I, I sat up in bed and clutched the sheets. And slowly I could understand what he meant. It was a voice all right, but the words were strange. Like someone trying to speak who has been dumb for years. Oh God. And he shot out one hand towards me, and although it didn't touch me, I had the sensation of something icy cold. I've done you a wrong, my boy, he said. Look in my old coat. Open the family Bible. You'll find it in Genesis. And then he turned aside wailed, wrung his hands. I watched him as he went. He seemed to merge into the dusk. He was like light, thin, white, transparent, but he seemed to fade away into the darkness, or else became lost in the moonbeam. I got out of bed when I could. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't find him got back into bed. Cold sweat poured off me. I don't wonder, said Michael, shocked to the depths, trying to make a pretense of calm. What do you think he meant? cried the mother. Martin's long fingers played nervously with his lips. How should I know? You say he mentioned his old coat? He nodded. I wanted to give it to Johnson two days before he died, said the widow. It was so shabby that he would cling to it. There was a scene. Where is it now? asked Michael. Couldn't you, with your powers, tell us that, Martin, old boy? Mrs. Drake spoke quickly before her elder son could notice that his brother was not prepared to reply. In the cupboard with all his other old clothes, I left them untouched after he died. He went towards the cupboard first, said Martin. They looked at each other significantly, as people do when they think they have found a clue. We must go up at once, said Mrs. Drake. Michael took her arm. Martin followed them. They entered the bedroom, where she had known so many unhappy nights. She knocked against the dressing table and bruised one hip in her hurry. Then she crossed to the built-in cupboard beside the fireplace and flung open the doors. Some old clothes of her own, three or four pairs of shoes, an old hat or two met her gaze. She took them out, threw them upon the floor, took down her husband's frock coat, which had done duty at funerals, and though very old, was not to be despised even now. Then she produced a dressing gown, and lastly, from among a number of old garments, the coat in question. The outside pockets gave no clue. Then, as Michael, sitting on the floor, ran his fingers over it, he heard a crackling, and felt something in a breast pocket. He took out a thin sheet of notepaper. Kneeling on the floor together, among the debris of the wardrobe, they read it. I was unjust. I want to make amends before I die, and I have a premonition of death. For my last will and testament, look in the family Bible. Genesis. Just as he said, put in Martin. You didn't say anything about a will, said his brother. He didn't exactly mention the word, but I remember him saying, look in Genesis. Where is it, mother? such a heavy book, said Mrs. Drake. We never use it now. It's got all your ages written upon the flyleaf. I remember your father's cousin Jane would do it. Silly old girl, said Michael. Oh, what does it matter? sighed Martin. Mrs. Drake went carefully through a pile of books in the cupboard, but could find no trace of the family Bible. They found it at last in the bottom drawer of the chiffonier in the dining room and between the pages of Genesis they found the will. It had been drawn up three years before, and witnessed by Cousin Jane and Henry Dean. 
The premonition of death had evidently come to the strong man, not a few days before he actually died, as they had at first supposed, but during a severe attack of influenza three years earlier. I remember now he was very nervous about himself, said the widow. Strong men always are when they're ill, said Martin. In the will, the property was to be divided equally between the two brothers. I'm glad your father didn't forget you after all, went on Mrs. Drake. But the will's already been proved, said Michael. The last will must stand, his mother interposed. You'll share and share alike now. It's only just. Your father regretted his bitterness. And to think I never knew. Her eyes strayed to the printed page of the Bible. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. It was the poignant story of Jacob and Esau. Her husband must have read that when he was ill. It had brought him to a new state of mind. The finding of the second will brought calm to Mary Drake's troubled spirit. Her boy, her baby, had not been forgotten. Perhaps her husband's heart had changed before he died. Perhaps he had become more like the man she once had loved passionately not the fiend she had known in later life. The proving of the second will took time. The technicalities of the law always do. But the inheritance of the two brothers was shared equally at last. It was only Martin, benefiting by several thousands, who took it so calmly. His mother sometimes wondered if his father's change of spirit meant much to him. It was nice, of course, to have the money. Surely the justice of the thing must appeal to him. He must be sensitive. Was he not clairvoyant? Perhaps a medium? Martin and his brother talked for a long time about investments one night beside the fire in the old-fashioned dining room, with its horsehair furniture and its copper kettles on the mantelpiece, and its willow patterned china upon the dresser, and its sporting prints to decorate the walls. Well, they had taken advice upon the subject that very afternoon, and were viewing themselves and each other as men of property. With the money well invested, there was no knowing what they might do in the future. Neither of them had any responsibilities, any ties. Each had himself to consider, and money meant much to both of them, not merely because of the things it would bring them, but because it spelt power. When Martin went to bed that night in the old four-poster, which his mother and father had once used, he went to sleep as soon as his head touched the pillow. It was a large room, with low beams and only one door. Rain fell outside, and leaves rattled against the window pane. But they had no power to disturb Martin. He had his fortune. He had power. His dreams as the night passed were fantastic. He could see himself as master of the hunt, living in the fine old manor. He could see more money coming from his mother later and a wife and children sitting beside him at a table, spread with silver and crystal. Yet he had never really loved in his life, but the woman in the dream was beautiful, and she was looking across the table with a smile. He could see himself lifting his glass, draining it. It was a funny thing to experience the sensation of good old wine in a dream. He could feel it nice to his palate, soothing to his stomach. His legs were tingling. He saw himself stand up and propose a toast. Then the scene changed. They were all at the hunt ball, he and his friends, and they were drinking at the bar, and then later dancing madly in a gallop. There seemed to be a fever in his blood. He danced the gallop, which had returned to fashion in order to round off a hunt ball program, as he had never danced it before. A girl was looking up into his eyes. He bent over her, wanted to snatch a kiss. Then he awoke. There was something in the room. He could not see it, but he could feel. It was not the blind, either, which was flapping at the open window, nor the curtain which was blown about, 
and then seemed to bulge into the room. And how the wind howled. It was on him before he knew. He could feel something scorching him. Was it this fiend's breath? Or the heat from the wood fire crackling in the grate? He tried to get up, to escape, but small greenish eyes looked into his. His father stood over him, brooding over him, with intense hate and loathing on his face and in his eyes. There were no hollows as in a skull. It was the face of a madman who acted with disconcerting logicality. The thing was trying to speak now. What was that nonsense you told them? The face of a skull? The voice made him cower in his bed. You lied. You never saw me. I did not come. Martin put his hand before his eyes to shut out the sight. The feeling of heat was terrible. You lied. You lied! The voice screamed out the truth in a crescendo. Sweat poured off Martin's face. His tongue was cloven. He lay trembling as if in an ague. Words failed. Screams would not come. Yet every nerve in his body cried aloud in pain, in horror, for the peril that was to come. And the thing was drawing nearer, leaning over the bed. You forged my name, and the witnesses' names on that false will. You wrote letters in my handwriting about my premonitions, and I never so much as thought of death in all my life. Would to God I heard. You were a forger. The voice died away and then rose again in a scream. His father's great red hands with sandy hairs upon them reached out towards his throat. Martin made a last effort to cry out and then the thing was upon him. His blood-curdling scream was his swan song. His brother and a fireman forced their way into the room. The smoke was thick, but the fire had not done much damage. Martin, however, lay white and still upon the bed. They lifted him before they realised. The doctor came. It was not the fire that killed him, he said. It didn't even touch him. But these things are easily explained. Death was undoubtedly due to shock. Today's story was The Birthright by Hilda Hughes. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thanks once again for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time... Sweet dreams. <laughs>